So then you might say, well, if you have all this remarkable technological and economic privilege, much of which was unearned, and even much of which, or some of which, was purchased at the cost of historical atrocity, what should you do? And the answer is, you should put yourself together so you're as good ethically as you are rich financially. But that's a heavy moral burden and a heavy burden of responsibility. And then I think you can take these cheap and uninformed roots out, and some of that's just based in miseducation and pure ignorance, so that you can accrue to yourself the moral virtue that's necessary to solve your conscience without having to do any of the real difficult work that making a full accounting of your talents and atoning for your privilege would actually require. Yeah, I think that's 100% right. And I think that... Um you have then a group of people, people, I mean, people who look like me, people who are my age, um, that are struggling to find an identity, struggling to find mm -hmm. a, a, a structure, struggling to have a standard of living, maybe better than their parents. Um, and then even people who come from wealthy backgrounds, there's a tremendous pressure, right? If you're born to that level of privilege, it's very high to, very difficult to maybe exceed uh, your family. In the past, though, we had a kind of paternal structure uh, where you're saying, hey, even your kind of uh, 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 kind of wayward son of a wealthy family, you have to come into the fold. You have to be a good steward of these resources. You have to, you know, build libraries. You have to build uh, the opera house. You have to do great works that show that you can assume the responsibility of this wealth and prestige and then really provide it back to the community in a substantial right, way. Right, right, right. That's right. very difficult. It's much easier to, you know, put on the kefia. Uh, uh, march at a BLM protest and then, you know, run a family foundation Heck. writing checks to a bunch of useless nonprofits. You get the status, you get the prestige, you get the love, you get the identity as a kind of class traitor, but it's an adolescent posture of rebellion from a generation that refuses to grow up and become a father, let's say, uh, or become a, a, a mother, become a kind of matriarch figure. And so you have these permanent children that are in eternal re re revolution against their parents, uh, that for them are, are symbolically represented in this society. And they feel like they can stuff that feeling or satisfy that feeling with these kind of, uh, 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 the sugar high of, of revolution by play acting. Um, but it, it, it deals tremendous damage to real people. And you know, the reason I'm a conservative, as opposed to where I started 10, 15 years ago as a kind of on the far left, is that I saw in the international context in many places uh, what happens when these ideas take hold. But I also saw, I even spent five years in three of America's poorest cities observing these communities. The theory of systemic racism, white privilege, intersectionality, et cetera, all the solutions that they proffer are very good if you want to achieve social status and position in an Ivy League university. They're disastrous once they trickle down or are imposed on poor people of any racial background. And so this, 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 this feeling, this psychological profile, I, I think is one of the most important things of our time. I think that's why your work has been so successful and why people on the left have furiously, uh, 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 kind of rejected it and furious, like uh, in a deranged way, lashed out against it because you're calling them to responsibility. Yeah, you know, I got a funny story for that, man. So, you know, I, I've had the misfortune to be invited to speak at universities and, I say misfortune <laughs> because although some of the time that goes quite well, the most disastrous public events of my life have been on university campuses where I'm harassed by student radicals or literally accosted by them, yelled at by unbelievably narcissistic brats, um, generally harassed a lot by the administration for even daring to go to the damn university, having all sorts of obstacles put in my path when I agree to do so, and then... Um, and spending a lot of time and resources to speak to people who are often extremely narcissistic for very little effect. Now, that's not always the case. I've had good experiences at Cambridge and at MIT and at Stanford most recently. And so it can work, but it often doesn't. And so the, the, uh, I figured out a way to go to a university and have it work. And this is really quite funny. I figured this out about five years ago. So imagine I'm invited to a university and I'm worried that there's going to be protests. And I worry because sometimes there are murderous people at those protests. It's no joke. And people get in yeah. my face and they threaten me and physically as well as psychologically. And 
I'm not afraid of that, but it makes me so angry that I'm afraid of my own anger in situations like that. I, I joke with my security people that half of the reason they're there is to stop me from attacking other people. And I mean that, you know, it's a joke, but it's also not a joke. Anyways, I figured out very early that if I had a meeting at a university at eight o'clock in the morning, I'd never have a protester in sight because none of them had the bloody discipline to stick to their principles in an, with enough, what would you say, assiduousness so that they would sacrifice their late night drinking session the night before so they wouldn't be too hungover and bleary eyed to come out and confront the, you know, the evil, pro, the evil professor who is going to go out there and warp their compatriots. And so the fact that I could circumvent the bloody activists by merely showing up early in the morning is a pretty fundamental indictment of their, the fundamental maturity of their motivation and also something that's blackly comical in the deepest possible sense. And the fact that these idiot professors on these left-wing campuses take the messianic delusions of these overgrown adolescents with some degree of seriousness, overlay that with compassion, and then invite them to become useless activists and thereby fulfill their moral, the moral demands that their own conscience puts on them is an unbelievably deep indication of the absolute moral bankruptcy of the modern university. I love it. And, and, and weak parents create narcissistic children. And so the administrator is the weak parent and the children are, are quite narcissistic. And, you know, this reminds me, your, 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 your story reminds me of two things. One, you know, my, my dad was an immigrant from Italy, uh, came over as a teenager with his family, very poor, had nothing. Uh, his father immediately died when they came over. My dad, uh, uh, uh became the man of the household and, uh, he was a great athlete, a good student, got a scholarship, was living at home. And this was during the kind of 1960s, 1970s Vietnam War protests, all of the kind of hippies and, and uh, that kind of counterculture. And, uh, you know, my dad got a scholarship to go to, to go to college, was working the whole time to support his mother, support his sister, kind of help the family. Um, and, and, and he would tell, he says, you know, uh, I see all these hippies, all the rich kids were the, were the hippies and the protesters and the counterculture. He says the working class kids. You know, we had to get a job. We had to take things seriously. We had to, you know, show up to work. And, uh, you know, it, it, it really is this kind of class inversion. It's this, yeah. this inversion of Marxism where our elites are the Marxist revolutionaries and our working class people are our conservatives because they need that set of structures and values in order for them to have a dignified and meaningful life. And so we have an elite class that wants to dissolve all of the social and economic structures that are providing the basis for stable lives at the bottom. The second story I'm going to tell you is very interesting. Uh, my wife and I uh, uh, went to see you uh, in Seattle, Washington, a number of years ago at one of your speeches. Next to us was this uh, kid, young kid, maybe 25. We got to talking to him before the show, before you and Dave came on. And he said, you know, I drove, you know, an hour and a half. I drove from the kind of more rural area here in Washington State. And, uh, you know, my life was a mess a few years ago. Um, I was doing drugs. I was not showing up to work. I was waking up late. I was, you know, just couldn't quite get things together. I was anxious all the time. 